Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Margot Hemingway. And like many wildlife species, my dad, Jack Hemingway, has migrated south to warmer climates for the month of January. He's asked me to step in and guest host this incredible Idaho, a great opportunity for me to share the wildlife and the wonders of this beautiful state. Our first story tonight takes us north near the Canadian border to Lake Pend Oreille. It's the largest and deepest lake in the state, stretching over 180 square miles and in places measuring well over 1,000 feet deep. The winter landscape has a harsh, austere beauty, almost as if nature, in a desperate bid to conserve warmth, has narrowed its colors to stark shades of black and white. The cold penetrates, slowing movements and muffling sounds. It creeps up the mountainside, lingering among the trees and obscuring the peaks in an icy fog. The struggle for survival takes on an eerie quiet that has its own peculiar intensity. To waste energy in this frigid land is to court death. The strong will endure. The rest are destined to surrender to the unforgiving law of nature, survival of the fittest. But this seemingly hostile environment somehow supports life. A pair of mergansers burst suddenly into movement, orchestrating a flyby in perfect formation. Perched midstream in the icy creek, a strange little bird called a dipper performs a bizarre, bouncing dance. Near the mouth of the stream, gulls gather, their dull plumage blending perfectly into this world shaded in gray, and high in the trees, bald eagles survey the shoreline, searching for kokanee salmon. The kokanee is the basic forage fish in this lake. Everything is dependent on the kokanee. The eagles are here because the kokanee are here, and uh, it seems the more kokanee we have, the more eagles have shown up. Sometime near the end of October, the kokanee salmon begin their spawning run. During the next two months, thousands journey to the mouth of Granite Creek, seeking out the fast-moving waters upstream to lay their eggs. Mysteriously, the eagles know that prey will be plentiful, and within a few days, they quietly appear to settle in the pines above the creek and begin their silent vigil. We've seen as many as up to 250 eagles here at one time. Um, right this year, we've only seen about... Uh, three dozen to about 50, something like that. Fisheries biologist Bruce Thompson has kept tabs on the bald eagles here for 10 years. Three mornings a week during the Kokanee Run, he brings a crew of biologists and volunteers across the chilly waters of Lake Pendere to Granite Creek. They come to collect eggs from the Kokanee Salmon for Fishing Games Hatchery Program. What they do is swim upstream this time of year to try to find a place to spawn and this fish trap blocks the entire creek. They're trying so hard to find their way upstream, they'll swim across this weir back and forth until they find the openings we've left for them. And they continue on into the trap. When the kokanee are ready to spawn, their colors begin changing from a silvery fish to bright red. They are cousins to the sockeye salmon and at one time made the same long journey to the ocean and back. Then glaciers moved in, cutting off their route to the sea. But the kokanee salmon learned to adapt to fresh water and over the centuries lost the urge to migrate. Biologists call this residualization. Now they are a vital link in the food chain of the big northern lakes. Keep that lead line down and just slide along it with your foot. The trap fish are collected using a seine net, which can sometimes be a tricky business. Hang on, I'm not on the lead line. Okay, bring it up. From the seine net, they're transferred to a holding tank. A concentration of tranquilizer has been mixed into the water to calm the fish. This protects the fish from internal damage and also makes them a bit easier for biologists to handle. This is a green female. You put some gentle pressure on the front end of the eggs there. You can see that there's no eggs coming out. So we go ahead and we go ahead and keep them in a, what we call a green pen. And we just leave them in there until we're done and then we'll release them back into the creek. In a couple days they should be mature and we can take the eggs from them then. Those females that are ripe are gently squeezed and bright red eggs drop into a bowl. Sperm from a male is added to fertilize the eggs. Most of these adults began life the same way. The fertilized eggs are transferred from here to Cabinet Gorge Fish Hatchery to be raised to a two-inch fish. The tiny kokanee are then brought back and planted into the waters of Granite Creek. 
Eventually, they find their way downstream to Lake Ponderé. Two to four years later, the adult fish returns once more to the waters of their youth. They spawn and die, leaving a legacy of eggs to carry on the species, and the cycle begins again. Well, this is a spawned out female kokanee. She dropped her eggs before she got to the trap. And her belly's all thin and flabby. And she's also been grabbed possibly by one of the bald eagles that are sitting downstream or release her back into the creek where the other fish respond. And she'll probably end up in front of an eagle again before the day's out, and uh, that's how the life cycle ends around here. It's not just the wintering bald eagles that rely on kokanee for food. They are a critical part of the food chain in Lake Ponderé. The bull trout and the Girard camloop, the big Girard trophy camloop here in the lake, are really dependent on the kokanee population. And that's why we're very concerned about making sure we have good reproduction um, at the hatchery, good survival at the hatchery, so we can have a good population of kokanee here in the lake. For the communities on the lake, a healthy kokanee population also translates into a strong economy. Sport fishing and tourism is a big business here in the summer. But in the winter, it can be a quiet place, a place where nature rules. One of the strong sweeps down to capture the weak, gliding out gracefully over the gray water with its kill. It is war, a struggle to survive, and the story of the battle is written in the snow. The hushed stillness returns and nature pushes on. Down below, the kokanee salmon continue their struggle upstream to spawn. And high above in the pines, bald eagles keep a silent watch. Go for it. The majestic bald eagle seems a natural choice for our country symbol. But some of our founding fathers, like Benjamin Franklin, would have preferred the wild turkey. Although native to North America, the wild turkey has only recently become a resident of Idaho due to an aggressive transplant program by the Department of Fish and Game. The first 17 wild turkeys were acquired from Colorado and released in Idaho in January 1961. Since then, through trades with other wildlife agencies, wild turkey range has been expanded into small pockets throughout the state. Some flocks, such as those in North Idaho near Bonners Ferry, have done so well that they have outgrown their habitat. Now biologists are beginning to use these groups as a capture source to establish even more wild turkey populations in the state. It's not all that sophisticated. Some kind of bait scattered inside a cage and a stick propping up the door with a length of rope attached. In fact, for most of us, it probably brings back memories of the great trapping experiences of our childhood. Then it was the backyard, a cardboard box, a twig, some string and a few breadcrumbs begged from mom's kitchen. A simple bird trap, but perhaps unlike the efforts of our youth, this one really works. The key is patience, a trait a lot of us didn't cultivate as children. The cage has been set up and baited for several days, so on this cold morning, these birds don't suspect a thing. They begin their daily routine with a casual stroll down the road to the trap site to grab some breakfast. Fish and Game Conservation Officer Greg Johnson has been parked close by long before dawn, waiting and watching. Ideally, he liked to catch a good mix of toms and hens from different age groups, but sometimes in the early morning light, it's tough to distinguish one turkey from another. But finally, Greg judges the timing is right and pulls the rope. The door slams shut, and those caught inside are startled and jumpy. The rest of the flock senses danger, and in no time at all, they've raised up the road to the relative safety of the woods. There, they huddle in groups, keeping a furtive watch on the goings-on below. <laughs> the captured turkeys will be transported to their new homes in these cardboard boxes. The dark interior seems to calm them and the birds fare very well while en route to their new habitats. But the tricky part is getting the turkeys from the cage to the boxes. Who's going to be our first muggers? You can kind of go in with your back to them, herd them in the corner, and go down for the scaly part of the leg. If you, if you grab them on the back or you go up high on the drumsticks and pull down trying to catch them, you'll strip feathers. It sounds fairly simple, but it actually can become quite a rodeo. Hey, Ray. <laughs> I'm going up to the door. Watch these ends of these panels here. 
Fourteen young tom turkeys are in the trap, and not a one is too happy about having humans in the cage with them. Trying to get a firm grip on the birds proves to be quite a challenge. Go for it. <laughs> it's his first time. <laughs> Two turkeys are finally snagged, but the losses include one wool stocking hat and a few leg feathers on one of the toms. They, they grow back fairly quickly, but he's going to have a cold leg for a while. But the feathers on the legs and the tail and the back come out very easily. And I, I think that's a predator defense mechanism. You know, if something grabs them as they're flushing, you know, they're going to have a mouthful of feathers. And the crew marks each three. bird with a leg band, you see, recording its cold. age and sex yeah. before the turkey is boxed into a temporary home. It's not unusual for a first catch in an area to be all juvenile males. But Greg passes the word to trapping crews at more established sites. 117, 121. Got a flock of young toms. Uh, so you guys want to make sure you get some hens in there before you trip it. Have they come out of the roost yet? No, they're sitting uh, you know, right on the ridge. Um, they've flapped around a little bit, but not much more than that. The second time around, the muggers are a bit more experienced and is a much more polished operation. Both turkeys and humans emerge with everything intact. Among the spectators is rancher Nick Plato. He's become quite attached to these strange birds and even learning to talk turkey with them using a box call. But most important, without the cooperation of landowners like Nick, uh, well, we there wouldn't really be a turkey them, uh, population in North they Idaho. Get, they get quite a bit of feed now where we feed the cattle. And uh, though I do feed them, if that isn't available, we have some waste grain and, and we'll put grain out for them to make sure that when there's snow that they'll have a place to survive. And if it weren't for the, the farmers here that put up with them and they feed them and uh, they put up with the hunters that come around wanting to hunt them in the springtime and the people that drive by, you know, just wanting to watch and take pictures, uh, you know, we wouldn't have them here. Greg the brings a hen from a different capture to point out the identifying marks of juvenile males and females. The most obvious way to distinguish an immature male from a female is the dark breast feathers. This is young Tom. On the hen, the tips of the breast feathers are this light buffy colored. The male's heads, there are not nearly as many feathers on the head. You have red and blue coloring. Here it's pretty obvious. The hen, lots of fine feathers across the top of her head. As the tom becomes more mature, he'll grow a long, distinctive beard and spurs will develop on his heels. When he struts during the breeding season, he'll spread his tail, displaying a beautiful fan of feathers. But today is not quite as glorious. He ends up in a cardboard box, riding in the back of the pickup with the other turkeys. Two hours later, as daylight turns to dusk, the truck pulls into the release site. Biologists prefer to free the birds just before nightfall so they'll fly directly into the trees to roost. This way, the flock doesn't scatter, and in the morning, they'll easily find each other, establishing another new population of wild turkeys in Idaho. Wildlife watching has become quite an American pastime. A recent survey showed that over 76 million of us spent time last year photographing and observing wildlife. It seems the easiest time for us to see wildlife in Idaho is in the winter, when the animals are down from the high country. But bear in mind, it can also be the toughest time for wildlife. I think the wildlife viewing opportunities in Idaho are limitless, and the fact that no day is the same. Whenever you go out, you might always see something different. Fish and game biologist Bruce Hawk is rarely seen without a pair of binoculars close by. Field glasses are an important tool for the ethical wildlife watcher. They're far enough away from the road that they're really not being bothered by the traffic or the people or the dogs that are barking over here. And if they were all really concerned with us, their heads would be up, they'd all be looking at us, their ears would be forward, and, and these are very casual, they're still out here browsing on the, 
on the, the grasses and, and shrubs. The responsible wildlife viewer is careful not to disturb the wildlife. If we get too close, the animals are forced to move. An effort like this burns energy, a critical factor when an animal is trying to survive a cold and snowy winter. They're trying not to move because they don't want to use energy. They want to conserve every ounce of energy they can. Being a good neighbor to wildlife also means driving slowly through the areas where animals congregate, especially in the shoulder hours of dawn and dusk. Careless drivers endanger both themselves and our wildlife, and the results can be tragic. What we're looking at is an animal that got, that got mangled by a car or truck, and one of the things that happens, of course, is it looks terrible to passing motorists, and uh, it's kind of a grim reminder that we, that we need to be, to be careful for, for ourselves and for other animals. And I think we need to be aware of the fact that, that this animal actually, actually represents um, a life to other animals. We've got magpies and ravens and, and uh, different kinds of animals that will come out and feed on this carcass. And um, although we all hate to see this kind of senseless destruction, um, it is a part of nature. This is one of the first wildlife lessons that Sue and Tom Tracy will discuss with their two young sons today. Mac, look out your window. And look on the ground here near this road. What is it? What is it? Can you tell? No. I think it's bigger than a deer. Ow. You're right. You like to go see it? Yeah. I think death fascinates kids, and when they're, uh, when they're exposed to it like this, it's, it's a real interesting experience for them. And it, it, it overwhelms them, but there's a, there's a natural interest in it. Do you know why this, why this elk died? Why? It got hit by a car. No, no, not a car. Or maybe a truck. The elk must be thoroughly examined by four-year-old Mac and his younger brother, Bill. When all the questions have been answered, the family is loaded up and back on the road in search of wildlife that hasn't met such a tragic end. I saw some up there. Oh, look at How many all. do you see? Four. No, there's two more and another one up there. It's interesting to me to see the animals this close up. I'm not a hunter, so I don't get to see them during hunting season. But it's even more fun with the kids. They have the funniest reactions, and their eyes just light up to see animals. What do you see? Um, deal. How many do you see? Can you count uh, them for me? Four, four, two, one, two, four, three, four, five. Do you see any boys? See any bucks? A baby and a dead one. A baby and a dad? We think it's important they get out and see the animals at, at all times of the year, and in the winter time is the easiest time to see them. So they're closest to the road, and uh, uh, we can get out and spot them pretty easily without the kids getting too cold or too far off the road. I've heard that it's important to to stay behind your car so that you're not scaring the deer away and disturbing their it's their environment. So. We try to teach the children to respect the animals and their, it's their home. Look, at they're looking at us. Can you wave to them? Yeah, but I, let's stay behind the car now. So they don't see us, we don't want to scare them. Wildlife viewing is an educational experience no matter what your age. But watching the wonder in the eyes of a child is a gentle reminder of the magical world of nature we sometimes take for granted. They have the gift of curiosity, questioning everything, and they have the persistence to rapidly exhaust even the most knowledgeable wildlife expert. There are a lot of questions they have that have no answers. <laughs> yeah, we get lots of que interesting questions. Like, why? <laughs> why is the universal question? And uh, it's hard to answer because every answer has another why after it. Is he going across? <gasps> you bet. How does she do that without any big cars coming to get her? Well, there aren't any big cars, so she's being careful. A respect for wildlife is one of the most enriching gifts we can pass on to our children. It is the foundation for a lifetime of treasured memories. I think that as they grow older, they'll, they'll really be excited about teaching another generation about wildlife and how the outdoors is so important and how wonderful it is. Uh, we're really lucky to be, to be living in Idaho.
We close our show tonight in the same way we began it, with the stillness and splendor of Lake Ponderay.